you could see the name of his talk, Contextualizing Care and Essential and Measurable Clinical Competency. Um, it really goes with his life, which he has a CV that is so expansive that it's really what I would consider a book, besides having written a few books. Um, he is deputy director of the Center for Innovation for Complex Chronic Healthcare and professor of medicine and pediatrics and medical education at the University of Illinois, Chicago. That one statement encompasses a tremendous amount of workspace and territory, so I give him a lot of credit. Um, he served as medical education dean, university vice provost, and is the senior advisor to the provost currently at the university. Dr. Wiener's research focuses on identifying and preventing contextual errors in clinical decision-making and care planning. And he's developed strategies for identifying these errors, measuring the impact on health outcomes and costs, and of course, the goal of preventing them. Um, he does use unannounced standardized patients, and I do see some SP um, colleagues on here who with audio record their visits, their clinical decision support tools that enhance the um, contextual information in the electronic health record. I just wanna mention that he's written books that have wonderful titles, Listening for What Matters, Avoiding Contextual Errors in Healthcare, um, that was published in 2017. But his most recent book, the title really fascinates me on becoming a healer, the journey from patient care to caring about your patients. That's really a mouthful. The journey from patient care to caring about your patients um, was most recently published. Um, so I wanna thank him for being here today to introduce this concept to us. This really requires a larger conversation, an in-person conversation, and really more of a workshop style or a seminar of some nature, but we'll go with the journal club today and see where we go next with maybe trying to meet um, Dr. Wiener at a future date. So thank you for being here. And um, here you have your presentation up so you can get started. Great, well, thank you, um, Alice. You know, it's funny, I didn't mention this to you, but my um, when you were introducing to me, it occurred to me that it'd be fun to share that my, um, Previous boss, uh, when I was um, vice provost, was Susan Susan uh, uh, Poser, um, who is um, now your your president. Um, so small world. Um, that is a very small world. I'll make sure I tell her that I. Yeah. Had... So if you yeah if you see her, uh, tell her I say hello. She'll uh, get a smile out of that. Um, so um, so anyway, um, thank you. And the topic today is something I've been working on for. Um, uh, 20 years with a close colleague named Alan Schwartz, who's head of the Department of Medical Education at UIC. And it's really been neat working with, uh, you know, finding somebody I could work with who really, we complement each other. I'm, you know, I'm a doc, I'm a clinical physician, I'm a physician. And um, so I obviously see patients and I think about things from a clinical perspective. And um, Alan is a, uh, a cognitive psychologist and also a very strong methodologist and, and really a statistician. And, and so bringing together these very different uh, backgrounds has allowed us to, to do this work together. And, um, uh, and you know, it really started around, uh, yeah, for those of, you, those of you who've been around for a while, it was kind of around turn of the millennium that everyone was talking about evidence-based medicine. And I, I, I got it, started noticing that the, um, the residents who would present to me, I was a young attending at the time, uh, were very good at kind of knowing the latest research evidence. Um, and, but when we walked in to see a patient together, um, often a story would emerge. There was something going on in that patient's life um, that uh, was really in many in many instances a game changer that we would discover that they couldn't afford a medication we um, had been giving them or planned to give them that accounted for why they'd lost control of a chronic condition or um, they had had a sudden loss of social support or they had a new competing responsibility or um, or they'd become depressed and that's why they weren't taking their insulin or, and a whole, just a, a end, almost really an endless list of things. And that's life, right? People, patients like us have lives and those lives are complicated and they're always, you know, shifting uh, and they're dynamic and bad things happen, good things happen. But often those changes have very pragmatic, specific implications for planning patient care. 
And, you know, I came to think of that as context, but it became clear to me that this narrow biomedical focus on, you know, what are the guidelines, what are the best practices, what are the research studies shows uh, was just kind of becoming almost a mindset um, among residents and that, that oftentimes the note would look great. It would look like if you were audit the chart that they had kind of done the right thing. But then in fact, if you knew what was going on in that patient's life, you'd realize this plan is not not likely to work. Um, and so I came to call that a contextual error. This was a time when everyone was talking about medical error and a medical error is a concept that we're all familiar with. It's, you know, giving somebody the wrong drug by mistake or giving the, you know, maybe the right drug, but the wrong dose or God forbid, operating on the wrong limb. These are medical errors, but a contextual error is a kind of medical error. It's an error um, that where all the, you got all the other stuff right, but the care plan's still wrong because you haven't taken into account the context, what's going on in that person's life. And so I started to think of this as a quality of care issue, uh, really a skill that we really weren't paying attention to. We really weren't measuring. And, but I wasn't really sure how to study it. And then I started talking to Alan Schwartz about it and Um, You know, he came up with initially this kind of ingenious idea that we would use standardized patients, we'd actually turn them into unannounced standardized patients, and we would um, teach them scripts based on real examples that I and some of my colleagues had seen where a contextual error occurred, and we'd basically train the actor. And one of the things that was evident in all of these cases was that there'd be some kind of clue that the patient was struggling, the physician would probably miss. And so we started to construct cases around that. And that was the beginning of what turned into a 20-year odyssey that I'm going to kind of walk you through here. Um, and hopefully there'll be some use, useful um, learnings from this. So um, uh, by way of just, I have no, no, no interest, uh, no financial relationship or commercial entity to disclose here. So I think you're getting CME credit for this. Um, the learning objectives are um, just briefly that we're gonna be defining some terms. Uh, I've already kind of introduced you to them briefly, contextual error. We're gonna talk about four steps to contextualizing care that we think are really important cognitive habits. Um, We're going to talk about the implications of these errors, you know, how do they affect patient care, healthcare outcomes, and we're going to talk about some of the ways in which you can help physicians become better at paying attention to context, at contextualizing care. So first, what is patient life context? And I just want to start by saying that um, as I go through this talk, I welcome being interrupted. Um, And so it's sometimes hard for me to pay attention to the chat box. Um, maybe if one of you can, um, Alice, if you're able yeah, to- I'm here, to I'm here. Uh, yep. no and, uh, but, but feel free to turn off your uh, mute and just speak up. Like I said, I don't at all, I, I welcome being interrupted. So anyway, um, a, a, a patient life context is anything in a patient's life situation or their behavior that is directly relevant to planning their care. And I, I underline the word relevant here because it's really important. I think physicians often get um, kind of skeptical about the idea that we can possibly get to know, you know, everything that's going on in our patient's life during a 15 minute visit. And they're absolutely right. We can't, but I think we can agree that we need to figure out what's going on in their life. That's directly relevant to planning their visit today. And that's what we mean by patient life context. It's figuring out, extracting from the myriad things going on in a person's life. What do I need to know today? You know, that, you know, they're, that something happened since I saw them last time in their life or with their job or with their finances or with their emotions that have direct implications. Um, And a care plan is contextualized when it considers patient life context. And so that's really the task that we're going to be talking about today. Um, So I want to start with an example. And I want to preface this by saying that, and you'll learn more about this in the rest of the talk, that we take all of our cases from real life examples. And the way we do this is we've been handing out audio recorders to real patients for many years. And we invite them to carry that audio recorder into their visit. We get permission from the physician and we tell the patient they can can, put the audio recorder in their pocket or they can show it to the physician uh, if they want. They can turn it off if they change their mind. Um, But we have accumulated um, over 10,000 audio recordings at this point um, uh, of uh, collected for us by patients. And we have a team that listens to these audio recordings and codes them. Um, And you'll see in a moment how we code them. We code them for physician attention to patient life context. And so... I, whenever I give talks, all of these are taken from these recordings, um, and uh, and I kind of pick and choose them based on who the audience is and the key points. And so, in any case, this is a patient I call Mr. Phillips, who presented to a primary care physician 12 days after a discharge from a lengthy hospitalization for an infected prosthetic hip joint. Um, he was in um, a wheelchair when he came in for that visit. Now, um, when he was asked how things were going, he replied, "Um, I guess they're okay. It's been slow going. I was hoping to visit family out of town, but I'm not up to it. So um, noting that Mr. Phillips had been walking at the time of discharge, 
his doctor asked him why he was not uh, doing so now. Um, and Mr. Phillips explained that he couldn't safely drive to physical therapy, um, um, which is where he'd been referred, um, and that had set him back on his recovery. Uh, a kind neighbor had brought him in for this visit, and furthermore, he was suffering from diarrhea, making him reluctant to leave his home. So I just want to point out right here that the physician was somewhat astute in noticing that, you know, that this patient actually had been discharged ambulatory, and you know, clearly picked that up from the note, um, and and made the connection that you know this patient is showing up in a wheelchair, which ordinarily wouldn't be that surprising after someone's been hospitalized for an infected prosthetic hip. But this doctor was astute in noticing that that's not what they should have looked like. They should probably not have been coming in a wheelchair considering that looking back at the note, they'd been ambulatory when they left the hospital. So the doctor arranged for home physical therapy, also tested Mr. Phillips for C. diff infection, and then controlled um, his diarrheal symptoms with probiotics and, and loperamide. So at four weeks, um, Mr. Phillips was walking again and able to drive safely. So this is just a really nice example of, you know, of, of a contextualized care plan, of picking up on something. And we're going to kind of look into this in a little bit more depth. So how did this clinician get the care plan right? Well, first, um, as I noticed, the physician um, was astute in, in uh, you know, seeing that, this that her patient had regressed functionally from his status at hospital discharge. And it was a clue that his recovery was not progressing as expected. Um, second, She'd shared her observation with Mr. Phillips and asked him what might account for the setback. Third, in response, Mr. Phillips had disclosed the transportation problems and medication side effects um, that had derailed his recovery plan. And fourth, Mr. Phillips' doctor had worked with him to adopt the recovery plan to his current challenges. Now, just pay attention to the fact that there are four steps here um, that played out in a kind of very organic way. We have assigned a, um, a term to describe each of these four steps, and we've discovered um, I would say that we've, I, you know, we've kind of recognized that this, that it's very, it's really helpful to see this as a four-step process. And it begins with recognizing any clue that something in a patient's life situation might be impacting their care. Clinicians have to be on the lookout for these. And we call these contextual red flags. Second, whenever there's a contextual red flag, um, the clinician has to inquire about it um, and find out, you know, frame the question, find out what's going on in the patient's life that might be impacting their care. Third, um, the patient will hopefully share with them um, what is going on in their life, assuming there is something, there isn't always. Um, and sometimes it requires a little bit more probing um, to get the story out. Um, and then finally, uh, the physician will take that information into account when, um, when planning the patient's care and might require a modified care plan, as you saw with this example. Um, and you know, obviously that involved um, addressing the patient's um, inability to drive um, and um, and and the diarrheal nose. So um, if we take those four terms and apply them to this case, um, the red flag was the unexplained setback in the functional status following discharge to, to home. Um, the probe was, um, hey, Mr. Phillips, looking at your chart, I noticed you were walking when you left the hospital, but now you're in a wheelchair. Can you tell me more about that? That was, that was what was in on the audio recording. Um, Mr. Phillips related how he'd been demoralized by the diarrhea that he'd had canceled a few physical therapy appointments, and then realized he couldn't really control the gas pedal and brake safely when he tried to drive to an appointment. And then the doctor arranged for home physical therapy and effective treatment for antibiotic-induced diarrhea. So what I'm trying to do here is introduce you through this example to a way of thinking about the fact that patients often have clues. Um, if we're astute, we pick up on them. Um, if we're uh, persistent, we can elicit a narrative of what it is they're struggling with. And oftentimes we can incorporate that information. And that's what we mean by contextualizing care. Now, um, a contextual error is what happens when we don't do that. Um, and it occurs really um, at two points in that four-step process. Either we fail to probe the red flag or um, we fail to address the contextual factor in the care plan. So again, there's a four-step process. That's what we're hoping physicians will uh, do as a matter of cognitive habit. And there are really two places where they drop the ball. Um, and if they drop the ball in either of those places, you end up with a care plan that can basically look good on paper, but it's not likely to work for that patient. And that's a contextual error. Now, I want to introduce you to a flow diagram. And um, you, the clinician, if you're a clinician, are right here. And, and by the way, this isn't just physicians. This could be a, a nurse practitioner, could be a physician's assistant, anyone who's in, involved in direct patient care and in decision making. Now, um, what we're hoping is that you will pursue this pathway to green, to the contextualized care plan. And I'm just showing you the same thing I just showed you, but in a, in a different version that really 
represents what happens when you're in that room with a patient and the door is closed. Um, if there is a contextual red flag, it com could come either from something in the medical record, like that patient has started missing appointments or not refilling meds, or it could come something from something the patient says. Um, and if either of those contextual red flags are there, you will hopefully ask about it. The patient will hopefully reveal a contextual factor if there is one. And, and then you will hopefully address that in your care plan. You'll get up, you'll end up here with a contextualized care plan. Unfortunately, there are, are more ways you can end up um, missing the boat and ending up, you may fail to probe. Uh, you may, um, in which case um, you could end up with a, um, a, a, a contextual error. Um, you, the patient may actually tell you the contextual red, uh, red factor, even if you didn't ask about it. Sometimes patients just tell us what they're struggling with. You could, and but you don't address it you, and still end up with a contextual error. Or you could end up in a situation where you do pro, but it turns out that there's really, um, it was kind of a false, a false alarm. Uh, it turns out that it's really not a contextual issue after all, and the patient is doing just fine. So what I'm gonna show you is that when you're in a room with the door closed and with the patient, you are gonna go down one of these six pathways, whether you're thinking about it or not. Um, and our goal here is to kind of, you know, call this to your attention so you can become more purposeful in trying to go down this pathway when you're with patients and there are contextual red flags. So I'm going to show you examples of each of these taken from recent audio recordings. So you can start to think about um, how this applies to your practice. Um, so I'm going to show you first kind of somebody getting it right. Um, in this case, um, uh, uh, I'm going to skip. Well, actually, I showed you somebody getting it right, uh, which was the one we just saw. And now I'm going to show you a situation where um, they probe, the patient reveals a, reveals a contextual factor, but the physician kind of drops the ball. So here, um, a patient mentions that he's not been using his, his CPAP machine when he sleeps. The clinician asks him why not. The patient replies that he has a lot going on in his life, including financial stress, moving, changing who he's living with. Um, he said he felt overwhelmed and was having trouble keeping things together. Um, the provider acknowledged that it sounded like he sure did have a lot going on and suggested that using the CPAP machine was especially important as he'd be better rested. Um, and you, know, you can see that this was an understandable response the patient was like, yeah, you've got a lot going on. You really need to be sleeping well. You need to get well rested. Um, but that wasn't really helpful. Um, and, um, and so not surprisingly, four months later, the patient was still not using a CPAP machine. It was a missed opportunity to ask the patient if he thought it could be helpful to see a mental health counselor and or a social worker. Um, in, in many ways, the patient, the physician kind of missed the boat here. Um, and they kind of had cause and effect reversed. Um, in this example, we see a patient... Um, uh, uh, basically um, revealing a contextual factor um, and the physician doesn't address it in the care plan. So here, uh, during a new patient visit, a physician learned that their patient had been living with a debilitating pain in his knees and had significant untreated heartburn for a long time without seeking care. Um, the clinician didn't ask the patient why he hadn't sought treatment for these conditions. The patient went on to say that he was, quote, the type of guy who doesn't take medicines for anything unless it's, quote, really bad. Now, I can tell you, I have a practice. Um, uh, we do this project both at the VA and non-VA sites. As you know, I have a dual appointment, and this is, not surprisingly, a veteran, kind of a tough guy, toughing it out. And the provider did not respond to the patient's comment. This was a missed opportunity to address the patient's attitude towards medical care. Some patients think they can tough it out when in discomfort. It's possible this patient would consider treatment if he was assured it wasn't a sign of weakness. So um, I'm gonna show you a typology in a moment uh, for thinking about how we categorize these different contextual factors. They fall into 12 broad areas. And this is one that falls into the category of attitude towards illness. So we'll get to that shortly. Um, but here you can see that the physician kind of dropped the ball twice. They didn't probe. And then the patient went on to make a comment that really explained what it was that was driving their behavior. And again, the physician didn't address it. So this is kind of like a missed opportunity times two. Um, now, as I said, there's a framework that we found helpful with typology. And we found that all of the contextual factors, if you think about all the stuff going on in a patient's life, you can sort it into 12 broad areas. Um, the six on the left are very specific life circumstance issues. You know, an access to care issue could be that they can't afford something or they don't have transportation to get to an appointment. A competing responsibility could be, and by the way, these can be good or bad things. It could be that they got a, a job and they're working the night shift, which is better than not having a job, 
or it could be that they're caring for a sick family member, their spouse is very ill, whatever it is, it's derailing their ability to manage their care. So the six on the left are all life circumstance changes. The six on the right are things that are literally happening inside the person's head, but they're drivers of behavior, like the attitude towards illness that I just um, gave you an example of, or an emotional state, becoming depressed, depressed. Now, some of these can be biomedical issues, like depression is a biomedical issue, but if you're seeing a patient who's lost control of their diabetes and it's because they're depressed, you're not gonna be able to manage that, that diabetes issue until you address the depression. So that depression becomes the context for managing the diabetes. So again, we're trying to give you a frame for, for framework for how you think about this. Um, so again, this is just a way of breaking down. It's almost like a differential diagnosis for life context. We're trying to think about like all the things that are happening in a person's life that could be affecting their care today. They fall into these sort of broad categories. And the six on the left are literally outside the skin and the six on the right are inside the skin, but are drivers of behavior, if you want to kind of think of it that way. So as I said, the last example was an attitude towards illness issue. So we have been studying this using two modalities. One is the unannounced standardized patient, as I, I told you about earlier. And these are actors who we send into, into practices. We did this on a large scale for a while um, and um, very complex research, um, expensive research. We had to get permission from hundreds of physicians to not know when they're seeing a fake patient. Um, we had to create fake medical records, fake identities, fake insurance. Very elaborate, um, and but it was very powerful because it was an experimental design. We could send you know fifty doctors, literally the same patient, and have them drop the same contextual red flag, you know, and see how um, physicians varied in their response to the same situation. The physician was kind of like um, a rat in a maze, and this was a stimulus. If you think back to you know Alan's um, you know experimental psychology background, and then we moved from there to inviting real patients to record their visits, and that when they were moving from an experimental model to an to observational method. Um, uh, uh, you know, it lost some of its power. We couldn't do the apples to apples comparisons that you could do with unannounced standardized patients, but we could now see what happens in real life. How often are these contextual errors really occurring in actual practice and how are physicians responding to contextual information? Um, in order to do the um, observational work, um, we needed to come up with a coding system um, uh, that tracked these four elements. You know, um, uh, we had audio recordings collected by patients. We had access to the chart, and we needed to trade coder, train coders to listen for and observe. Is there a contextual red flag? If so, did the physician probe it? If so, did the patient reveal a contextual factor? And if so, was it addressed in the care plan? And you can see that that required. Um, some training and a coding manual. It actually took us about two years to develop. And we needed to get to a point where our coders had um, very high inter-rater agreement. We got to about 85 to 90% inter-rater agreement. So they could listen to the same audio, audio recorded encounter with the same chart with the same patient and have a very high likelihood of coming to the same conclusion as to whether uh, the contextual red flag was present, whether it was probed and so forth. And so we needed something that would be meaningful. Um, and it, therefore it had to have a high level of um, uh, inter-rater agreement. So I'm going to share with you this slide summarizes many years of studies, um, and these are sort of like our, you know, our, our greatest hits. So the first thing we found was that in actual practice, um, context matters, and about 40% of real ambulatory visits, effective care depends on identifying and addressing patient context. We found that in about 40% of those encounters in which it, you know, there's a contextual issue, a contextual, um, a contextual factor, physicians overlook it, um, and so there's a contextual error in about 16% of encounters. Um, we found out that these contextual errors uh, predict worse healthcare outcomes. Um, and again, I can show you why that is sort of um, not surprising. We also found that um, when physicians contextualize care, um, the number needed to treat is about six. So uh, one, about one in six uh, uh, of, of contextualized interactions compared to um, interactions where there's not a contextualized care plan, the patient has a better outcome at four to six months. And on the one hand, that might sound um, discouraging. It's like, wow, I have to do this six times to help one patient. But if you think about it, that would be a blockbuster drug. Like there are very few drugs that we give patients that have an NNT of six. So, um, you know, uh, and it has no side effects. Um, uh, contextual errors also result in overuse and misuse of medical services with higher costs. Um, and just to give you a little example of this, in one of our unannounced standardized patients, uh, we trained the actor to... Um, to say that, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, this was an actor who was middle-aged. Um, they came in on a really expensive brand name inhaler that was part of the script. Um, they said their asthma had been acting up. It had been worse lately. And they were you know, trained to drop a hint that they might not be able to afford this really expensive brand name inhaler and might need something cheaper. So they, they would sigh you know, about a third of the way into the visit and say, you know, doc, it's been really tough since I lost my job. That was part of the shtick. You know, they would say that. And, um, and we found that only about a third of the time did the physician pause and say, well, Gosh, you know, um, 
you know, something like, how is it hard? Are you, can, are you having trouble affording that? I see you're on a really expensive brand name inhaler, that kind of thing. More than half the time, the physician was quite honestly, seemed to be distracted with their computer. Like they, we could, we could hear them typing and they would say things, you know, like, um, uh, you know, uh-huh, you know, sorry to hear that. It's been a tough economy, but then they were just like, do you have any allergies? Like they would just move on. They would just be very focused on their agenda. And so a contextual error would occur. And when they did that, we found that they would, um, you know, order a lot of extra tests. They would order pulmonary function tests and they would tell the patient they needed to be more adherent. And they would often go up on a medication. The patient already had hinted they couldn't afford and weren't taking. And they might, you know, um, refer them to a pulmonologist. And so you can see why these contextual errors would lead to a lot of unnecessary care. When you don't know what's going on with the patient, you just tend to order more tests. So it led to a lot of misuse and overuse of medical care. Um, and, you know, um, that's expensive and it's not helpful. Um, and one of the most surprising findings um, was that physicians who contextualize care when seeing literally the same patient, because these are they, their visits were not on average any longer. And we knew that because we had the timestamps on the audio recorders. And initially we were very surprised. We didn't expect that. But when we went back and kind of tried to understand what was going on, we realized that when physicians took the time to probe, to find out like why this patient made this comment about, you know, it's boy, boy it's been tough since I've lost my job or whatever the example was, um, that that did add a, a few minutes to the visit. But then they saved time at the end of the visit because they weren't like, you know, lecturing the patient on how they need to be more adherent and you know, telling them they need to get all this extra care, PFTs, pulmonologist, adding more medicine. So it was, it was a wash, basically. So we discovered that contextualizing care, um, you know, didn't add time to the visit. It added time, but it also saved time. So it was, it was, it was neutral. Um, I want to shift now briefly, because I'm trying to cover a lot of ground, to um, the efforts we've made over the years to try to intervene. So uh, to help physicians become better at this. And if you think about it logically, there are three ways to intervene. One is through medical education. One is through um, quality improvement. And one is through uh, technology, clinical decision support. And we've worked in all of these areas. Uh, I'm going to actually fin focus more on number two, but I want to briefly mention um, one study we did because of uh, the kind of audience you are. Um, we, we got a grant. It's one of those STEMLER awards from the National Board of Medical Examiners to do a randomized control trial with fourth-year medical students. And during their sub-internship, we randomized them to go through a program where we trained them to contextualize care. And we then actually um, had them practice on the patients who they admitted the prior night. Um, and uh, it was really intended for them to kind of, you know, go back and in a sense, re-interview the patient and think about are the red flags that the team missed? Did we not probe them? What happens if we probe them? And, they, you know, they would have the aha moment when they realized, oh, my God, you know, no, no one asked about, you know, why this patient keeps coming back to the ER um, and with missed hemodialysis. Like, no one's asked them why they keep missing the hemodialysis. They just, just call them non-adherent or non-compliant or frequent flyer or whatever. And then, you know, let's go back and find out. And then all of a sudden, they would discover that this patient had this whole thing going on where, you know, they had a competing issue and they didn't have transportation and would change. And, and we found that was very useful because it would allow them to see in real time how it affected care. When we studied that, we had some gratifying and some disappointing findings when we did it in a rigorous out, uh, outcomes, you know, RCT model. We discovered that they were better than a control group of medical students when tested in a standardized patient laboratory. But when we did it, when we repeated it with residents and then tested them both with standardized patients, but also covertly by having real patients, you know, covertly record their visits, we found that they did a good job compared to the control group when they knew they were being assessed. But when they didn't know they were being assessed and we just assessed them in, you know, in vivo, in their actual practices, covertly, they fell back to their old bad habits of just being very biomedically focused. And we learned that it's hard to change what physicians do in practice and medical education often isn't enough. And I think it's just a useful lesson here because it shows that there's a, what I call a skills to performance gap. You know, it's one thing to change what we can um, a skill is what somebody does when they know they're being tested and, and performance is what people do in practice when they're just doing their jobs and they don't know they're being assessed. And that's harder to change. And so that brought us to quality improvement, which is changing practice um, in real time. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how we've tried to work on that. And then briefly, um, we've also used clinical decision support tools. We recently did a, did a major study on that, and I'll briefly touch on that as well. So as I said, I'll talk mostly about this one. Um, we came up with this idea of inviting patients um, to carry audio recorders into their visits. And we did this in the VA um, and hand those recorders back when they came out, um, 
have them upload at a secure server, code for those four elements, and then share the data with physicians. Um, you know, what contextual errors are you making and where are you contextualizing care? And do it on a recurring basis and, and not have me do it, but have a clinical champion do it. Um, you know, one of their peers. Um, and default would be to de-identify it, aggregate it across five or more physicians so no one's embarrassed, and let them just kind of learn, like holding a mirror up um, over time. And just just like all performance improvement, but you know, all the, the typical measures are cookie cutter measures, right? You know, are you are your patients getting colonoscopies? Are they getting mammograms? But in this case, it would be like, are you paying attention to the life challenges your patients are facing, and are you addressing those? And that really became the performance measure. Um, and so um, we would just literally put together PowerPoint slides like this from people's practices, uh, just like the ones I've been showing you. So this is from a recent one. Um, in the VA, a patient with congestive heart failure was discharged from the hospital following this episode of pulmonary edema. Um, he's um, seen in primary care. So um, red flag, he acknowledged to his doctor that he'd started eating a lot of takeout food. The doctor asked him why his diet had changed. The patient shared that his wife of 37 years had died two months previously. She had cooked for him, except when his daughter stopped by with meals, he was ordering takeout or eating frozen dinner. So this is a very poignant case when you know our coders listen to this on the audio recorder. The doctor said how sorry he was, and after discussing with the patient, ordered a social work and nutrition consult. The social worker set up a homemaker, and the nutritionist curated a meal plan and called the patient's daughter to provide education on a low-sodium diet. At follow-up visit, the patient was no longer eating takeout. So this is a really beautiful example of a physician who's contextualizing that encounter. Now, what we found is that when we gave feedback to physicians um, based on what turned out to be thousands of encounters that we audio recorded, um, we saw an upward trend over time. So this is the percentage of audio recordings in which the contextual factor was addressed in the care plan. These are the feedback sessions. You can see over time, we saw an upward behavior. So in other words, they were contextualizing more encounters. This is the same thing with um, contextual red flags, a percentage of contextual red flags that they were probing. Now, not all of our um, clinic um, interventions look this nice. Um, I picked this one because it looks nice. I wanted to share it with you, but um, overall we did find that this intervention is effective. Um, and, um, so, and, and I'll show you, we've, we've published quite a bit on that. Um, another thing we found is that we would take all these contextual factors and sort them into these 12 domains that I showed you earlier and, and then feed that data back to practices. So they could actually see in a kind of, you know, um, histogram format, what their patients are struggling with. So this would be one particular clinic at one particular time. We could tell them, Hey, you know, your patients, or it could be even one physician, this, your patients are struggling mostly with access to care issues. Um, skills and abilities deficits are kind of second in line. Third are competing responsibilities. So it allows you to get a, a snapshot of the context of things your patients are struggling with in your clinic or your practice. Um, we would give the feedback um, in a variety of ways um, through PowerPoints. We would send a weekly email with examples um, of care plans that were contextualized versus those that were not. Um, we, we, we got this approved by the ABIM, American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Family Practice, so they could get MOC credit for, for doing quizzes we would send them, um, in which they had to provide responses to the, how they would change the practice. Um, we started adding nurses, pharmacists, and front desk clerks um, to the audio recording program and giving them feedback because it's a whole team-based approach. Um, and we started giving individual clinicians feedback if they wanted it. So we used multiple methods of feedback in an effort to heighten self-awareness about the importance of paying attention to patient context and care planning. Um, so we did a big study where we um, had six, um, 666 providers, mostly attending physicians. We uh, did thousands of encounters and 67% of the audio recordings, there was at least one contextual red flag. 55% of the contextual red flags were probed. 57% of probes were un uncovered a contextual factor. 67% of care plans were contextualized prior to feedback and 72 post feedback. So there was a 5% improvement, a, a significant but small improvement with feedback. But over thousands of encounters, this starts to have a difference. We saw you know, that um, the, a good outcome, meaning resolution of the red flag, occurred in 46% of non-contextualized care plans compared with 73% of contextualized care plans, a significant difference. Now, this may sound abstract, but it's saying something very basic, that if your patient is, I don't know, they're not taking a medica medication because they can't afford it, or they aren't coming to visits because um, they have to care for a sick family member, whatever it is, if you find that out and you try to help them, whether it's getting respite care or switching them to cheaper generic, whatever it is, it helps. They're more likely not to have that problem at four to six months. That's all it's saying. Um, and we're just taking something I would say that's kind of intuitive and just measuring it. Um, we found that doing this over thousands of visits 
um, led to a small reduction in hospitalization rates across all of the patients seen by these 666 providers, a small percentage decrease across you know, many thousands of patients reduced, uh, they basically prevented almost a thousand hospitalizations using the VA's clinical data warehouse across the six medical centers where we did this uh, at, at a cost savings of $25.2 million. And the feedback, just the feedback, you know, paying our audio coders and sending that data and putting that data in PowerPoints cost uh, about $333,000. So that was a return on investment of 75 to one. Um, you know, very, very, very cost effective. Um, so we published this in, um, in 2020. Um, if you want, you can pull it up. It's open access um, and um, it you know, gives you more detail. Um, we also have, uh, it led to a program that's funded by the VA called the Page Preventing Contextual Errors Program. Um, and my facility is just in the process of hiring its first full-time um, contextualizing care uh, coordinator to run the program. So we think that this is a really important way um, of broadening what we measure and value in healthcare from just a bunch of cookie cutter measures, which I don't mean to put down. It, it's important that we're, you know, patients get colonoscopies and mammograms, but it's not adequate to just measure those things. And I think it leads to a sort of a, a mindset that I call sort of the efficient task completer mindset, where we just aren't paying attention to these contextual issues. And so I think it's important to, to, to you know, to value them. And we value them by showing that we measure them. Um, I find this is a really useful framework for putting it all together. And what this says is that, you know, to be a good doctor, put yourself in the middle here. You really have to be thinking about four kinds of information whenever you're with a patient. First, what's the clinical state? What's going on just clinically with that patient? What diseases do they have? You know, what's the state of those conditions? And the research evidence, of course, is what do we know about how to manage them? And I think a lot of times we get into the habit of just doing these two things, you know, applying research evidence to clinical state. Patient has hypertension, they have diabetes, you know, what's the best practice? But in fact, there are two other types of information. There's the patient context, what's going on in their life that could be directly relevant to planning the care and what choices belong to them, not us. Um, you know, um, things that are not really about our expertise, but about their life and what risk they want to take and what trade-offs they want to make. And so I think really our job is, is, as physicians, and I tell this to my residents, is with every medical encounter to say to ourselves, have I thought about these four types of information? Um, because otherwise, I think we just default to these. And uh, particularly on the inpatient side, we tend to often um, usurp patient preferences, you know, which is not respectful to their autonomy. And of course, the focus of, of, of my interest has been on patient context. Um, but good care is really integrating these. Um, and you know, I had a, a, a mentor who I dedicated my second book to um, on becoming a healer. He's a family physician named Simon Oster. Um, he, uh, he actually died just before the pandemic. He was almost 90. But um, he... Um, he used to say, it's really answering the question, what is the best next thing for this patient at this time? And I think the italics here are important. So this patient is really emphasizing the fact that every person is different. Um, you know, um, research evidence is based on thousands of patients. It's decontextualized, but every patient is different. And even if you know the patient, you don't know what happened since you saw them last. And that's what we mean by this time. And so context is dynamic. And that's really <clears throat> the, the point here. So we really have to think of eliciting this information at every visit. Um, as I said, we did a study recently that was just published in which we built tools into Cerner and Epic. We, it was a large grant funded by HRQ, and um, we built tools that allow the patient to go into the portal and indicate where they may be struggling in any of these 12 domains. That data appears in <clears throat> the physician's template at the beginning of the visit, so it's pretty fancy software, like almost like a problem list, you know, contextual care box. Um, uh, the, the system also minds the patient's encounter as soon as the physician opens the visit um, for contextual red flags like missed appointments, um, loss of control of chronic condition, frequent ER visits, all of that appears in the contextual care box. And then it basically <clears throat> um, drives algorithms that will um, either prompt the physician to ask certain questions or um, actually in some cases just suggest orders and write them you know, for, for all those social worker, pill box, whatever, and the physician just has to approve it. And the physician approves it, it then basically <clears throat> even adds that to their note. So really trying to streamline this to make it as, as uh, you know, physician friendly as possible. And we just did an RCT. So as I said, there's um, information provided by the patient through the portal that drives alerts and orders, info provided by the EHR that drives alerts and orders. Um, and um, we studied this both... Um, with real patient visits and also with unannounced standardized patient visits. And essentially we found that the CDS increased both contextual probing and contextualized care planning 
Um, contextualized care plans were more likely than non-contextualized clearance plan to result in partial or full resolution of the presenting red flag. Um, we didn't see a difference, overall difference between the arms of the study. Um, and this study was really challenging because it, it overlapped with the pandemic, which really made it difficult, particularly the unannounced standardized patient part. We had to abort that. We were sending fake patients as well, and we we're halfway through it when um, March um, of 2020 hit. And so um, I'm going to have to find some way to write this paper here, but this was, um, you know, really half, it was underpowered to really look at um, the, the, the cost effects of, of this intervention. Um, but we did, we did do a, we did publish recently um, uh, in JAMA open access um, on, on this data here just a couple months ago, if you're interested. Um, so I, I want to end by just making some general points here um, that clinical training and the culture of medicine reward, rewards efficient task completers. Um, and that, you know, the first book, um, uh, Listening for What Matters, Avoiding Contextual Errors, is a very um, hardcore research quantitative type book that looks at our data, looks at our, our, a variety of studies. We actually have a second edition that has can be coming out in the spring, uh, but it, that's sort of our, our research book. Um, On Becoming a Healer really um, grew out of the last chapter where it became clear that you couldn't just look at this in a hard-nosed cognitive way. I think we have to ask harder questions about the way in which the training that we go through as physicians um, started, actually, I think he's in pre-meds, um, you know, uh, and then through medical school with this incredible focus on um, multiple choice tests, um, regurgitating data, and then as medical students and interns were really focused on being efficient, getting tasks done. How does that shape us and turn us into, you know, people with narrow blinders? Um, and I think that contextualizing care requires prioritizing really in a broader sense, the well-being of the person you're with. Um, and that sometimes comes at the expense, you know, of getting through our checklist. Um, sometimes you just have to turn away from that to-do list that we have and, you know, and just figure out what's going on with this person. Like why, why is their life why are they not showing up for appointments or not taking their meds? Like what's going on? And until you do that, you're, you're not going to probably be successful with anything else. Um, um, so I find that, I think that one of the things that contributes to burnout is just this sense that there's this birdie on our shoulder telling us that, you know, we really shouldn't, we really need to get off our train and turn and face the patient and figure out what they're struggling with. But we're just, we just sort of feel like this incredible <laughs> need to do our thing, which is to get through our list. And, and, we, and at some level, we know that, um, particularly with the demographic I care for, that it's, it's probably not going to be very useful if we don't first figure out what's going on with the patient. So I think when a patient's behavior seems irrational or puzzling or, or, or just dysfunctional, um, you know, the caring response from us is to just ask them about it um, and um, just, just find out what's going on and not just not make assumptions and, and that in many ways, if we do that, then we will be contextualizing care. That's really what's behind this. Um, and, um, uh, and so that's really the, um, um, the kind of non-research way of thinking about this. And my, my, my mentor, Simon, used to say that the best way to show you care is to ask questions. And I, I think it's a really profound insight. You know, when we talk about what caring, we, we, you know, we have this or empathy or caring, we, we think about it in this very abstract kind of um, Def, you know, abstract kind of hard to pin down way. But, you know, he said, look, if you really care about somebody, a patient who's struggling, you're going to ask them, hey, you know, I noticed that, you know, you don't seem to be, you know, managing very well with your patient, with your medications or your disease. Like, what's going on? Can you tell me about it? You know, and just keep asking them until, you, until, and there, until the, and he, and almost like that should come first. Um, and, and that that's caring. Um, and I really think it's an, it, a very profound, I, I found it to be very profound um, in, in many ways. Um, so I wanted to share that. Um, so um, uh, I have a few resources before I kind of open this up. Um, uh, there's a, I started a, a YouTube series um, less than a year ago. We're now on, I think, uh, number nine. Uh, we're working on number 10, but it really is designed to break this down into sort of 15 minute um, videos that begin kind of with like a little fireside chat where I talk about some basic component of contextualizing care. And then um, and then we go into more depth, um, uh, and we're actually working on video number ten now, which is going to um, have actually uh, some standardized patients who are high, we're training to portray various examples, so that we can walk through those. But it's really intended to kind of train people to understand the lexicon and to bring this into their teaching. So check that out. Um, I have a, a podcast with a good friend of mine from medical school, um, Stefan Cortez. Um, he's a he's a physician in, in Alabama, and we. We started this a few years ago where we try to talk about this um, 
And this, it kind of, it goes into many of the themes of On Becoming a Healer. I, again, the second book is also called On Becoming a Healer. Um, for example, we just did one on um, the whole organic chemistry um, debacle that occurred um, at NYU, um, where, um, you know, a, 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 a revered organic chemistry professor was, was dismissed after 80 um, pre-meds basically um, complained that they, you know, felt his course was too hard. And so we kind of explore it from different vantage points, you know, and often Stefan and I will take different positions on it. Um, and, um, but I, I, I felt that, you know, the position I took on this was that, you know, we have to ask you know, all of your educators, we have to ask, you know, I believe in reverse engineering curricula, right? You start by saying, what, what you know, what do we want a doctor to look like? Uh, what, do, what do they need to know? Who do we they need to become? And then we work backwards from that. Um, and I, I fr quite frankly, don't see um, how that gets us back to um, these extremely um, long and difficult to remember um, organic chemistry formulas um, uh, that, um, and, and I think it raises, and I, th and I think it raises deeper questions, not just about organic chemistry as a gateway or weed course. And, and is weeding really what we want to be doing? Is that, is that really what um, uh, the, the culture we want to create? And, and how does that um, perpetuate during the culture of training? And then how does that turn us into efficient task completers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I check, check that out if you're interested. Um, and then, you know, here are the, the two books, as I said, this is sort of the more research focused one. And this is the one that's more, um, you know, about kind of a guide for uh, more philosophic for, for people going through the, the experience of becoming a doctor or being a physician. Um, uh, this work um, it, it ref it has been funded by many uh, organizations, including the Department of Ed Veterans Affairs, Agency for Health Care Research, very partial list, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National Board of Medical Examiners, a lot of people funded it, but the views expressed are, um, are my own um, and not those of funders, um, and I'm especially required to say that if they're federal funders, um, like these are. Um, uh, uh, Wendy was very kind. Um, it was funny. She, um, I, I know you end with these. Um, initially, uh, she was going to apply this to a review article that I sent you all. Um, and um, it, it kind of wounded my ego because it was a new review article. And um, it was just a review article. And I sent it because, and, and it had terrible scores because like, uh, you know, and so I wanted to get like, I wanted to look a little better. So I picked one of our more um, uh, cited papers, just because I wanted the numbers to look good. But our, in reality, um, our, our overall, our papers are somewhere between um, uh, dismal and good, um, and uh, and so I picked one of the good ones for Wendy to uh, to walk through. Um, so Wendy, do you want to say a few words about these numbers? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, and thank you for a great presentation. So um, the bibliometrics that I pulled are from Scopus and Altmetric, um, and as you see on the screen here, it gives you um, an insight on into how this particular article is accessed. So the article that we're actually looking at the data for is called Patient-Centered Decision-Making Healthcare Outcomes and Observational Study. The citation is at the bottom of the slide. Um, we're looking at the usage, um, so how many people have pulled the full text, how many have viewed the abstract, and as you can see, it's in the thousands, <laughs> so it's been viewed widely. Um, um, in addition to that, there are 137 citations that cite back to this particular article, um, and there it's been captured over um, 971 times. Um, some are export saves from a platform called EBSCO. Um, the one that I want to actually focus on is the um, Mendeley reader saving, which is 189, which is very high. Um, and typically there's been an article, and I've discussed this um, in previous sessions, but the number of saves that you have through Mendeley readers is more of an indicator on whether this particular article is going to be cited again in another article. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have alt metric, which are the alternative met metrics, um, how much impact uh, this article is making out in the wild, not just cited literature. So there are four news outlets that um, have referred back to this particular article, two blogs, um, 98 tweeters, um, and a total of 104 tweets from the 98 users, um, which had an upper bound um, uh, viewing um, of more than a million followers. Um, once again, the Mendeley statistics that you see here that I've covered, um, and 144 Dimension citations, so essentially other articles that have cited back through the platform called Dimensions. Um, and so this is a very highly rated article. And um, what's interesting is um, I typically give you a map of where people are accessing the article from. And this one, um, this time I didn't include that in the slides, but I did look it up and it was actually very far reaching. It wasn't just North America, it was um, North America, United Kingdom, Australia. It was actually some in Japan, Austria. It was 
um, very diverse, um, so, some in South, South America as well. Um, so I thought that was very interesting in terms of interest and um, different uh, users who have interest that's not just limited to the North, to North America or within the US. Um, and just to finish off, not so much about the bibliometrics, but there's been um, some questions asked in the, the chat box, um, yes. which um, Dr. Weiner, I think you might find interesting and maybe wanted to kind of answer some of those questions. Thank you, Wendy, for your Thank last you. minute pull out of this. I, it's really one of the largest articles I think we have PR'd since we've started this journal club. And I'm going to let Rebecca go with her first question because she agreed to be the discussant today. Am I wrong on that, Wendy? It's quite large, this article. Yes, it's one of the higher, the high, higher, if not highest, we've um, seen right. so far. Okay, so Rebecca, I'm going to let you lead off with these discussion questions. You could start. Um, okay, yeah, thank you so much for such an incredible talk. Um, this is uh, your work is, I think, so important to the mission and values of our, our medical school. Um, so um, I know. Um, so my question, my first question, sorry for putting too much in the chat, but I, there was a lot that this year talk was uh, uh, prompting my, my uh, thoughts. So I had first asked about like, if you did any um, self-reflection from the physicians um, who were not able to recognize a contextual red flag and what their um, either their perceptions of why they missed it or how they felt afterwards. And just I'm kind of doing a, a study on medical error disclosure among medical students. And um, I've found, you know, various reasons for why the students report having missed an error and um, then how they felt afterwards. Um, and tied to that, I guess, is burnout if there's not a way for us to kind of process our own failings. Um, how does that impact our ability to, right. to um, move forward? So it's a great question. It's a very complex one. And we have done some focus groups. Um, and I'll just share a couple thoughts. One is there are a list of reasons physicians give. Um, uh, one of them, just a few of them are, you know, um, uh, I, I, missed it. I was busy focusing on medical record. Um, I didn't hear them say that. Um, or um, I was afraid to open a can of worms. I felt like if I asked them that, they'd go off on a long tangent and I didn't have time and I was afraid we wouldn't get to other stuff. Um, or um, I was afraid they were going to tell me something I probably wouldn't be able to help them with anyway. Um, all of these are things that we hear. And you know, I, one of the things I say, I certainly say to my residents is, look, you know, um, two things. One is uh, the fear that a patient's going to go off on a wild tangent should never stop you from asking a question that you think could help them. Um, you need to learn a skill of redirecting them and saying, look, I'm really sorry. We only have 15 minutes. I'm sorry, but I need to get back on track. Like you can't let that get in the way of, of um, so I think that's a physician skill. Another thing is I say, look, there are a lot of things that are biomedical. We can't help patients with either, um, the, you know, um, and we don't not want to know them. We still want to know that a patient has, you know, um, a, a condition that maybe we can't help them with, but we still need to know it. So both of those are fears I think we have is that we just feel like we're not comfortable going in going in those directions. So I think those are, those are common reasons I hear. Another reason is I feel like I don't have time for this. And one thing I can tell them empirically is that actually some physicians do ask these questions and their visits are not on average longer. And we know that. And I think that's a helpful thing because you actually save time on the back end. But I do feel like, and this is now just me, it's just my opinion. I do feel like um, when just listening to thousands of these, that a lot of it has to do with just physicians become disengaged over time. And I think burnout it's a vicious cycle because, you know, if you spend eight hours a day, you know, seeing a patient every 15 minutes and you're just kind of disengaged and you're going through your checklist and asking, you know, basic questions about whether they've had, you know, a flu shot or whatever, um, and you're not really connecting with that person, it's, it's deadly. Um, and, and then that makes you more burned out and you become more disengaged. And so I think leaning in, I hate that, it's kind of a cliche, but leaning in and engaging with patients is what makes medicine joyous um, and making that your priority will lead to contextualized care planning. And, and, and so I do think, and again, this is just my opinion that we, when we talk about burnout, we talk um, a lot about the externalities, like you know the horrible bureaucracy and the utilization review and the terrible computer and all that's true by the way. But I think the way in which we become disconnected from patients and become efficient task completers is a vicious cycle and is part of the problem. 
Um, yes, I, I, I think that um, our school really strives to impart um, the importance of empathy. And, um, and I wonder if you um, have, in, in folks that did pick up on the contextual red flag, if, if their reflections were around that value of curiosity and empathizing. And to your point of like, who, whose plan are we trying to execute? Our plan or what is the, are we in service of the plan that's best for the patient? Yeah, I think empathy is a bit of a mixed bag because the term is interpreted in different ways by different people. Um, and, you know, if you, and some people just interpret it as a feeling, like I feel terrible about this patient. That's not useful, right? Of course, I mean, your patient doesn't benefit by your feeling anything. It, they benefit by what you do to help them. And so I, I really love the model that Simon takes, which is caring. I, I prefer the term caring because and caring in the form of curiosity and asking questions. So if your patient seems to be struggling, ask them why they're struggling, how they're struggling, what's going on. Like to me, that is a very concrete thing we can tell our students um, because it's practical and it leads to helpful things we can do and it leads to connection. Um, and so I find that and you, you can call that empathy you like, the term is less important, I think, than explaining to them that it's more than just feeling like, you know, you can, you can feel, oh, I'm so sorry that you, you know, you lost your job. But what really matters is saying, well, how is it affecting your care, right? Um, are you able to afford medication? So that I think is the message to send students. At least that's how I think about it. And that kind of- I think what you're addressing is empathy, really. Not empathy, compassion. The importance of compassion, because compassion is the act of behavior showing empathy. And what you want to do is be compassionate. Yeah. Whatever the term is you choose, because I don't have a, I don't, you know, whatever the term is you choose is explaining that you're talking about something that is active. It's picking up on evidence that person is struggling, yeah. asking them about it, seeing if you can be helpful. It's that process. What I found fascinating, this was a ingenious talk. Thank um, you. Having practiced uh, 40 years and still now doing some scholarly activity development. Um, I had the blessing of training at uh, the biopsychosocial back in the 70s with at Strong Memorial Hospital. <clears throat> so I was blessed with mentors who appreciated all this. What I found is uh, when, and when 1995 and 1997, CMS took the AMA's two different recommendations of bullet counting of level of care, I found the tail wagging the dog. Um, so I, I, I think burnout certainly can make this worse, but without burnout, it was a tough thing. I used to say as they were tracking us to make sure uh, our healthcare attorneys said, oh, it's illegal to upcode or undercode. Um, I said, yes, but they're only going by what I can document in the chart. And, and that's what they view. And I think to your point, um, uh, regarding some other things you've written that I happen to read and loved about how things are documented that didn't happen, other things like this that are so important aren't documented. So just from my experience and my observation with teaching at all levels over the years, uh, this would this should be mandatory uh, listening, but I think the challenge, and you already expressed it, is when we go to measure it, whether it's uh, surreptitiously um, or with a actor or re in real, uh, if people know they're being evaluated, or you ask them, well, how did you feel about this? Getting their feedback, you're going to get one answer. How do you change the behavior? Because one, you're measuring the skill or observing okay. the skill. Alan, let him answer because we're about to close out and um, it's important. It, we're at one o'clock, so. Yeah, by I, all I, means. You, I'm you said it, you, yeah, you said, you, you said it well. I, 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 thank you. Yeah, you did a terrific job. This, thank you very much. This needs um, to be uh, incorporated. I see the residents now and they didn't learn it as med students and, and they don't have the med Alan, 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 it's after one o'clock. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna Thank take you. it with Saul offline because I'm a Chicago boy. Okay, so. <laughs> take it with Saul. He's on Twitter, he's he's very easy to communicate with. No, I know, I, I, I've um, already got all the Everybody has to jump off, Alan. Nice. So let me just, could you put the last slide up please?
Yep. Um, so the last slide is, um, is just um, my evaluation. You'll yep. get and you'll get his PowerPoint and email everybody who attended. You also have um, the ability to come next time to our next journal club, um, which is January 11th from 12 to 1. I'll send out the PR on that. Dr. Schlegel will be presenting an important Lancet article from the Lancet Commission on Health Professions Education in the next 10 years going forward. So going from now to 10 years out. Um, Dr. Fernard, can you put the survey link in the chat so that we can? I just put it in there. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody. Um, I'm in the middle of a site visit in Poland, even though I'm in Lake Success, and I really must run back to my site visit in Poland. So I want to thank Dr. Wiener. This is an introduction of him. I would love to bring Dr. Wiener to Northwell. If anybody could advocate how to do that within their systems, please, please, I'd love to bring him to Northwell in person so we could spend time with him in an extended way, because I think his work is so aligned with what we're trying to do in the hospital, but most important in our medical school, also with our young learners. So we must get Dr. Wiener here and I'll work on that. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and thank you. And say hi to President Poser. I will. I'm going to send her an email of your opening slide. Take care. Well, uh, nice to meet you. I was wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.